Uh, good morning and welcome to Fridays with Frisco. Um, Frisco with Friday, Friday with Frisco, either way. Um, it's going to be a short little presentation today. Um, we're just going to be going over just a few things just with uh, void and reissue and then archiving. So I won't take up too much of your time today. Um, the first thing um, that I just want to kind of review and go over are um, what when you do archive certain things, um, what what does this hide that from? So the first one I want to kind of go over was the employee portion of it. Um, again, when the employee is archived, that means um, when you go into the employee, archive the employee, that's going to hide it from all of the options under core. You're not going to be able to see that employee anymore. So it's just the employee is kind of gone. So you will not say employee unless you do the include archived, which is on located in on the top there. So you still can see if you need to bring in an old employee that you archived, you still can bring that employee in by just doing the include archived. So they're still out there, they're just kind of hidden. On the next one um, would be for like the employee's position. This one will hide it from um, certain options, components in the, um, on the software. So if you're archiving an employee's position, um, it's going to hide it from the new contract um, so they won't pull into the new contract. Um, if they're trying to add attendance days for this employee, it won't show on that. Um, in the EMI entry, which is underneath the core option, it won't show in there either. And then when you're trying to pull in an employee through current or future to add them, you're not going to see them there also. Um, the payroll processing, um, any of the pay reports, you're not going to show, see them there. The tax estimator, the benefit obligation reports, um, any of the EMIS position reports, and then any of the wage obligation reports. So when you hide that position for that employee, um, the employee is still marked as reportable, but the position is um, will hide from all of these. And again, these we do have these all listed in our documentation under position. So if you ever have questions where what it's hiding, you can just go to uh, position and archive positions. And it does show that all right here. So if you ever have questions, it's available to you. And again, if you want to include that employee's position to view it, you, again, you can include that um, on the um, include archive, which is just like the employee is um, included at the top. So you can just bring that employee in if you want to just see that um, archive um, position for that employee. On the next one, um, it would be the compensations. And again, we have this in our documentation. So if you ever have questions, we have that right out here at the top. Um, what, what components does it hide if you're um, archiving a compensation for the employee? So you have your, again, your new contract is not going to pull, pull, um, pull in that compensation. Any attendance for that compensation, EMIS entry. And again, current or future, so we'll not pull that employee. So if you have old compensations and you don't want to see them when you're bringing them in, when you're going into future or current, you can go ahead and, and archive that. So that way it won't show on that drop down when you're trying to pull those employees in. And it doesn't get confusing if they do have old compensations, like three records for the same one. Um, you can go ahead and hide that. Um, the payroll processing and pay reports. So again, these are the components that will be hidden when you have a compensation that is archived. And again, you can bring in and show any employees that have um, their compensations archived by just including the include archive. So again, I just want to kind of go over that, that those are out there. So if you ever have any questions of why an employee isn't showing or something, um, you might want to look here in the archive um, section first to see actually what it's going to hide. Okay. Any questions on the archiving? Not too much on that, just kind of going over what those do. Hey, Andrea. Yes. 
This is Andrew with Woco. Hey, something came up in a training we were having with districts the other day. Okay. And that is that at the beginning of the school year, you've got people with two compensations. Correct. One is still on because it's for, for EMIS. And the okay. other one is on because it's the one being paid. Correct. But in that, in that situation, how they're having a hard time figuring out in future is current. Is yeah. yeah, which one uh, when you're in current and future? Yeah, and yes, I mean, it, good question. Um, yeah, it errors if they pick the wrong one, but like, right. how can they tell before that? Okay, good question. What we were suggesting to employ or to districts and ITCs is um, like here, like this drop down box, you might have several one, you know, several different ones for position one. And he's asking, how do you, you know, tell which one you're supposed to be, the old one or the new one, but you have to keep them open for EMIS reporting. Um, what we're suggesting is in compensation, if you go to like an employee that has multiple ones, I don't know if I have any here in my test account, but just for, I'll just grab one just so you can see. Um, label, this is what you're gonna wanna use. Um, what we suggest is every year for fiscal, like fiscal year, do FY 2021. So when you put that label in there and go, and then when you go to the current or future drop down, it's going to show that label in there. So they'll be able to tell then by that, which one is the current one. So the old one could be fiscal year 2020, the new one for this year's fiscal year 2021, and then so on. You can do that for each year. Because obviously the position is not going to change the name, but again, the contract is different for each year and you don't want to pay them on the wrong one. So that is where they can put that in and update that. Okay. So label doesn't, that, that doesn't print anywhere like on um, I don't slips. believe it, it is under, because the description I believe is the, what prints on the pay stub and the label is what is going to be under the current or future. Okay, but let I me look at that because I thought it was the I thought it was the other way around, but I could be confused because I'm not looking at it right now. Okay, well let me let me change one here. Let's just try it. I thought this is what we we had just discussed yesterday in our meeting. And if I'm wrong, then I will definitely get back to the programmers and we'll get you an answer. So, so let me go ahead and look at that. And we'll go ahead and do future. Great. And is there a two? That's my employee. Yes. Okay, cool. So that's what shows up there. I guess my the second question is, is that also then what shows up on their pay slip? I will let me look because I know I have that in that if it doesn't, then that'll be perfect. That'd be perfect. Okay, let me look here because I know we have this in documentation what the label will show. And if that is it, so you're saying you want that to be good for the current future, but you don't want that to show on the actual yeah. con okay. Gotcha. Well, yeah, because if it was on the pay slip, then it would kind of lose the like if we have people, you know, they bus drive in their cafeteria, and so that label is helpful to print. Okay. On the actual. Uh, okay, on, I will have to look slip. into that because we have that as it is a description on the pay stub. So I will have to get back to you. You said this is Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. With okay. Loco. Okay. Yeah, maybe if like I don't know. I guess I don't know what description is used for. Maybe we could use that or. Um, yeah, we just would want to not use the label because that that whatever it is, it need we still need that to be on the pay slip. Okay. 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 I will double check that and make sure if the label is the one that's printing on the direct deposit. Um to I, I, I will double check that for you to make sure it is in the description. So okay. awesome. Thank because you. Because you want to leave it one way or the other. Okay. Yep. I can check that for you. Thank you. That was a great, great question. Any other questions? Okay. Um, then what we'll be moving on to is just a little bit of the EMIS reporting criteria, um, kind of where um, we show all this um, information 
um, so you know what what is should be included when you're doing EMIS. Um, so the reporting criteria, um, you can find this under the EMIS entry under core. And we have this for um, what if the uh, employee is archive employee. So again, going back to the archive. So for the SIF data collector, um, if the employee is archived, then that's gonna hide it from everything. It's not gonna pull into, CIF, CIF, uh, into the collector at all, the positions or compensations, neither of them. So that hides it from everything and it hides it from the collection also. So it's not gonna pull in. But if the individual compensation is marked as archived, but the employee is still marked as um, reportable and, and is reportable to EMIS and not archived, then that compensation will not get pulled in, just the employee side of it. So it will only pull the one side of the employee, but it won't pull any of the positions or compensations into the SIF data collector. Um, how do compensations um, get included on in the report? Um, again, you need to have um, compensation start and stop dates um, within the current fiscal year. And you want to make sure your start and stop dates are within the prior fiscal year, has a business and separation date, is the prior fiscal year, and also has a separation reason. So that is how your compensations get reported. And also they have to be um, flagged to be reported as to EMIS. Um, another one is you want to make sure maybe the higher date is in there because I did have a ticket a while back um, where the higher date wasn't entered in the position screen and this was causing an error. And all it was saying was missing value for position start date of 2021. And what we found out that um, it was a position um, on, the, on the position screen um, to make sure they have a higher date entered on that also because it will flag an error. Um, some other ones, some other ones that we do is uh, employee marked as reportable team. So if the employee is marked as reported to EMIS, then the employee will be included on the collect employee CI information. So, and so that is just the employee side of it. And then the position compensation is the CK record. Um, they are all collected separately. So the position compensation is marked is not reportable. And again, that will not be included on the collection. For the EMS reporting configuration, um, every time um, you're reporting your changes, this is the first thing that the districts um, are gonna wanna make sure they go ahead and do. And they wanna go under the configuration and make sure that they change that reporting year. Because sometimes when they start running the reports and they're not the, the the people are not pulling in correctly or not some are missing, usually this is what it is: is that the fiscal year has not been changed to the new reporting year. So again, just it's just a reminder to make sure that they do this um, after they um, did their final collection and starting the new new fiscal year. <clears throat> is there yeah, any way to get that fiscal year not to format with a comma in it? Um, oh, yeah, we do me. have, yeah, we do have a juror issue out there for that. Um, okay. Yeah, I know it does look kind of odd, doesn't it, with the comma in there. But yes, we do have a juror issue out there for that. So, and, and hopefully in, in the future that will be changed. So, all right, thank you. Um, the next thing is the EMIS contractor CJ record. Um, if the, if the reportable to EMIS field for the position, employee, or the compensation is false, then the CJ worker record will not be included in the extract. So this is something that we kind of added in here just so you know, if you do have these CJ um, records um, and, it's, and they're not getting pulled in, this is probably um, why. So just do a double check. Um, for the contracted service of the CC record, Again, if the reportable TMIS flag on the CC record is not marked, it will not be included in the extract. So again, just a reminder on that. Here's the EMIS. And I believe this is a new one. CC record. Oh, I do have one in there. Okay, great. 
And see, we do have that reportable to EMIS flag on there. So the system is looking at that flag. So if that's not marked, it won't pull in. So just a reminder to, uh, to your districts um, that does need to be checked if they do have any CC contractor service. Okay. Let's go back to the CJ records for a second. Yeah. Yes. You probably have a Jira issue already for this, but there's nowhere where I can get the um, state, the credential I, uh, certificate ID on that CJ. So if I'm looking at the screen and I would like to include the um, staff ID, I can't get it. Okay. And that was a... I was working with a district the other day and that was really confusing that I, you know, I had to go somewhere else to find that ID. So the staff ID for the CJ is okay. It's not on there. Okay. Let's see there. Okay. All right. Staff ID on the CJ data record. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I will add that to my notes also. We'll look that up and see if we might have a jury issue out there open for that, and then I will check. So, and I'm sorry, who was this asking? Brenda from Neil. Brenda. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Okay. All right. Any other questions on EMIS? Okay. Um, let's see. We'll move on to our next one. Um, this is just some things since I didn't have too much to go over, I just wanted to add a few other things in here. Um, if you're doing a mid-year contract change, we also wanna make sure, because um, those are kind of treated differently when you're getting pulled into EMIS reporting. Um, so archiving the contract, the one old compensation and, and just having the one is doesn't work. So when you're doing a mid-year contract change, districts are going to have to do some um, updating to the position EMIS related fields and enter in what that total new amount should be. That's where um, the mid-year contract change they're going to have to do. Now, this is, like I said, only if they're doing mid-year contract changes to the system that they will need to enter in the new total contract amount. If the con contract work days had changed or hours and day or the FTE, they're going to want to make sure that they put this information in here. Um, so that way, when the, when the data collector is looking, it knows that to look at this information um, instead of the other two um, compensations, the old or the new. The system can't, um, right now, can't pull the correct information. So this is what we suggest if you are doing that. <clears throat> um, and if they do, we do have this in our checklist down here. Mid-year contract changes. And then we do have that set up here. So. Um, to make it a little easier, they can use a mass load and use these information, fill in these, and then do the mass load. Um, so that way they don't have to do it individually. So to make it a little easier for them. Hey, Andrea. Yes. But this is Andrew again. I have a question about this. Sure. Because we have two districts that did this mid year. Okay. Um, so on the new compensation, so the compensation that, you know, after the mid year has taken place. Correct. The, the contract amount field on the compensation does, is not used for anything for, comp, for calculating, correct? It's obligation that feeds into the paper period and all that stuff. Right. So why couldn't they just put the full year amount on the new compensation? What's... Will that work as well? Because that's actually how I had them set up. The mid-years was put the full amount 
of the, like the full year as amount on this new one. And then obligation is just what's left after the mid-year took place. I, I did that based on, I think what you, what your documentation had said. Okay. So I guess is it, if you did it that way, if amount really equals the full year amount on the compensation itself, do you need to put amount on the position screen too, or will it pull correctly? I will have to look to see where EMIS is pulling from that compensation. I'm assuming it's pulling yeah. from the contract amount. So you're saying you're putting the full correct amount on the contract amount in compensation, correct? Yeah. And I did that actually based on, I think, the documentation on okay. the wiki on the mid-year. Because it, it basically it was saying contract amount is informational and obligation is what feeds into all the calculations. Um, so I figured, Hey, just keep the full year amount on there that way. Yeah. Okay. So the contract obligation is the new one or what the difference was. And then you yeah. were the full amount under the contract amount. That's correct. Yeah. So like obligation, like if mid-year took place, literally mid-year, it'd be like 22,000 something would be an obligation and 44 something would be an amount. Okay. Yeah. So they I wouldn't think... match each other for the, on the second one on the new one, they wouldn't match each other. And so then you could just mark the old one as not reportable okay. and the new gotcha. one as reportable. And hopefully, I guess that's my question is when it, when you're not using those override fields, is it pulling from obligation or is it pulling from amount? I thought it was contract amount. I didn't think it was looking at the obligation, but I would have to check with Andy um, on the software yeah. to make sure where exactly EMIS is pulling from. So it sounds like we're going to be okay. Like from, you know, we don't know for sure, but it sounds like because I had them put the full year amount in amount that okay. we won't need to do those position overrides. I Correct. just guess that's Correct. something that I think if that's not in the documentation and somehow we stumbled into that. Okay. Probably it would okay. be good to Great. put it yeah. because then when you're doing the mid-years in new contract, you could just update that there instead of having to do the mass load after the fact. Okay. And would your days be correct then on that new mid-year contract change? Your contract days and everything would be correct? It would not because it, the mid-year oh, okay. contract yeah. change would adjust yeah. the number of days to be the remaining correct. days. So that's okay. what I was going to say was yeah. you still have to update the, still have to update the days. position yeah. uh, for those extra fields for those okay. days. And okay. anything else that would change. Yeah, and that's that's where the position would come into play. So if something changed, I mean, not necessarily have to change everything and put everything on the position. I mean, if if yeah. it's pulling from the contract amount here, but you're so your position days are different um, or work days, then yeah, there's they're going to have to do that update because the system won't pull okay. correctly. And I I didn't even I don't know why I didn't think about yeah. that with days. I knew with yeah. hours because but most of the people didn't switch their hours, so it was like right. like the hours per day. So we were like, ah, it's not a big deal. But right. okay, so the days would need to be yeah updated. They, yeah, they still would need to be updated. But I will ask Andy about the contract amount. If that is the correct amount, then maybe that can be left alone, and all you have to do is add the uh, the days in position. Okay. What um, one less step, but. Yeah, I, I can, I yeah. can, see if that is the case. So, okay, great. Thank you. That's a great uh, Thank question. You. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions on that? Okay. All right. So, so, and again, just one of the, just remind you that we do have all these mid-year contract change checklists out here under our appendix, under checklist. Um, if you weren't aware of that, or just to let your districts know that this can be helpful to them, and we have it broke down for each one um, to use. And then way at the bottom, we do have a calculation on um, how these mid-year contract change calculations come about. So usually through this, we can get the correct amount um, and how the system is calculating to this. So, okay. Any questions? No. Okay. So the next one. Um, the other things I wanted to go through was um, the report. I know uh, at this point we don't have a per debt report that shows um, like it did in classic, but we do have other reports out there that can help you um, pull in some information to help you through those. 
Um, the one we have is the EMIS report um, under which it, it shows the employees that are going to be reported to EMIS um, through the generate employee report and the position report. So these are the employees that are going to be reported. Now, if you see, the only thing is, you know, if it's missing an employee, you kind of have to do your research to see who is missing. But um, these reports can be a little helpful. So to you. Um, the other thing is we have, um, we have a wiki page that is has our mass change in report that is out there to share for um, our ATCs. Um, and it shows all these different mass change procedures. And we have some here for the EMIS. If they need these, um, they can do a mass change to do change the compensation flag for the EMIS to false. And we also have clear the EMIS contract fields, hours, amounts, and days. This is another mass change that you can use at the year when the fiscal year needs to be cleared for the upcoming um, fiscal year. And then the new contract EMIS, we also have this one too. And that one is down here. Mass change for EMIS reportable. They're all running in together. There we go. So new contract EMS reportable. So if you need to change the flags when you already got your new contracts in, um, you can do this. We have a mass definition uh, definition um, that you can run um, for the new contract. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you can take a look at all these other mass changes out here that maybe you've been wanting, needing to um, how to do something to do a mass change and, and maybe it's out here for your use. And then down below here, we have the report definitions. And here is where you can use some of these report definitions to pull in um, EMIS inactive positions that maybe aren't marked. So you can see, oh, these are supposed to be marked and they're not. Um, EMIS active position report, active or inactive, excuse me. So you have one or, or both. Um, you have your EMIS active contract compensation report. So here's another report that we determine if the EMIS is set or not. And then you have this for your non-contract compensation. And then you also have your inactive and your inactive non-contract. So you can look for active employees and inactive. So maybe this will help um, ones that didn't know this was out here. Um, definitely take use of these uh, for EMIS um, to help uh, your districts through their reporting. Any questions on that? And then I also wanted to let you know, we have our EMIS checklist out here, which is down here under USPS EMIS connection. And then we have two reports that help you with your checklist, the final L reporting, and then we also have our new fiscal year initial L reporting checklist. Okay. All right, so next on to our void and reissue. Um, I know we have a lot of um, districts that have had some issues with um, like voiding. And what we have found out is how they're voiding the checks is they were doing, a, we actually had a bug where it was allowing you to actually reissue a voided check. And this is where we are finding out where the steps were going wrong. Um, so we got that bug fixed. So now they cannot reissue a voided check. So they can't go in, void a check, and then try to reissue it. Um, the steps would actually need to be to actually um, reissue the void the check. So voiding a check would be just if you're want to void a check and then maybe run a separate payroll to correct the employee for the correct amount. So that's when a void would come into play. Now, if they were trying to reissue a check, this is where the system would actually void the check and then reissue them a whole new one. So this is where we were thinking that somewhere in between they were trying to void the wrong check, avoid the check that was wrong, and then they were trying to go ahead and reissue it. They were kind of missing, I think, this step. 
So like I said, we went ahead and, and now they can no longer void a check and then go ahead and try to reissue that check. And then that throws off other things like your payables, things are just, it, it just doesn't show um, the correct, um, how the, a check should actually um, be voided. Um, so, so what you want to just make sure, let's see. If you have, um, I also have, if you're trying to avoid a check from classic, um, a reconciled check can be reissued, but if uh, first they must reconcile it, reissue it, and then reconcile it again. So again, if you do have um, checks out there that are reconciled, um, all they need to do is, but they need to reissue it. They just have to make sure that they go ahead and um, unreconcile a check and then go ahead and reissue it and then make sure they go ahead and um, put that check back to reconcile. Um, another thing is, let's see, there was one I wanted to show. There's one because I know that we at this point, um, we don't have where the um, Detail of the pay stub doesn't show when you're trying to reprint a check, but we do have, um, there is one out there, um, print payments, checks and direct deposits. And under here, this is where you can get that detailed pay stub information. So when you go ahead and reprint it from under here, under payroll, then you'll be able to get all that payroll information. So that is out there. The other thing is, let's see. If you have, let's say, changing a payee for an address and the address was wrong, we're in the wrong place here. So we're under payee and you already, you know, um, printed the check, but the payee address is wrong or the payee name is wrong and you want to correct that. Um, what you would have to do is, go to my information I'm going to be using. Let me check one second. Okay. So we want to go in to the payee that it needs to be changed. So we'll industries. Oh, let's spell that. There we go. You want to go ahead to the PE. Go ahead and change your address name. Maybe the address name was wrong. So I'm just going to change that to test lane and save it. So that's your first step. Then you want to go into back into your PE. And then you want to go ahead and void the check. And here's my Stillwell industry set. I want to go ahead and change. So I need to void that first. And I voided the check. So now it put it back out here on outstanding pro uh, processing, outstanding payables. And there it's back now. So now when I click on it, post it. And I'll go ahead and do PDF so we can just verify that the check was corrected. Okay, so when we bring that check up, now it's six six test lane. So that is how you can go ahead and change a void a check and correct a, correct the address, void it, and then go ahead and add the new um, puts puts it out on the payables, um, repost it, um, and then you have a new check with a new address. That's pretty nice that that option is out there. Um. Again, if you're voiding and reissuing same payee payable, so it's considered like um, if you ran a payable and you have five checks and they're going to the same place, but you accidentally forgot to put them together. 
Um, again, you can do this same scenario, change the payee for all the payroll items. So make sure they have the same payee and address. Then you go in and void all the checks, all those five checks that you want to be able to put on one check. And then that will put it back on outstanding payables. And then it will select, um, then you select that and post it and it will create one check. So that option is out there too. And I believe we have this under our appendix out here. Yeah, voiding process, voiding um, USB payroll file. No problem, sorry. Let's try that again. There we go. So, and here's the option um, for the voiding of payroll checks. And so that would be payroll checks. I have that out there. Just don't know where that is. might be under, so I remember where everything is. Processing, oh, payments, let's do that again. Yeah, sorry, it was there, I was in the wrong place. So it is under there under payments and payee, we do have the instructions there um, of how to do those two steps. Okay, okay. Um, the next thing would be the new option that we have out there is where you void um, checks. And before it wasn't going out to USAS and you had to actually manually do the, um, add that to USAS for the um, expenditure. I think that's what it's called. And then, but now we have that new step out there that was just added. And I think Lori probably went over there on Friday, but so if you have a voided check, so let's go ahead and we'll void. Oh, I guess I gotta go under the right spot here. Check. Okay, so let's do payroll check here. And we're going to fail. Not having a very good time here. There we go. Because I want to get, I want to get a check. And I should have looked at what my check was. There we go. Let's do three seven 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 two five ten ninety. Okay. So after we find our check here, there it is. Okay, so here's my a check that I need to void. And then I'm gonna go ahead and void that and confirm. So now when we go over here, we have our payment void and unvoid submission file has been added now. And now you see my employees under here. So here's a few that I have done already. Um, just in testing, and it just kind of shows, uh, it will show everyone that you have submitted over to USAS, and you can view those details too. So I'm going to go ahead and post to USAS, and then I'm going to um, submit, see if it worked, oh, and then we go under our Pending transactions, let's keep our fingers crossed. It's came, it came over, there we go. So, so now we have our pending transactions that now on the USAS side, they can go ahead and post this um, to make all the necessary uh, updates to their side of things. Okay, so is there any questions on this part of it? And then it just, until it's posted, it'll just keep on saying, it will say pending. So it does give you that update. So, so any questions out on that? And also we have all our um, useful procedures that do show those voiding process and USPR. Um, and then we also added that new step in here um, to post that to the USAS side. 
Okay. Um, I think that's kind of all we have to go through today. Um, again, it wasn't too much, but um, again, is there any questions besides, and I will look into that label, um, the contract amount for Andrew and Brenda on your CJ data record. And I'm going to, okay. Then I think we're all set. Um, again, thank you for joining me today. Um, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you.